The ABTA welcomes you to breakout session number three, caregiving. This session will discuss common issues that caregivers face, such as strategies for caregivers to help themselves and their loved ones with brain tumors, and mechanisms for improving caregiver quality of life. If you have a question, please use the chat feature found at the bottom of your control panel. We will address questions at the end of the presentation. Our speakers today are Andrea Dombrowski, a licensed clinical social worker and senior clinical social worker at Moffitt Cancer Center, and Raylene Simpkins, a registered nurse patient navigator at Moffitt Cancer Center. Please welcome Andrea and Raylene. Hello guys, and I have a slide oh, available, so just let me know when you want me to advance. Perfect, next slide please. Okay. Thank you, Kylie Nicole, for the gracious introduction. We will begin with our statement that there are no, there are no disclosures or outside support to report. Next slide, please. For this breakout session titled Caregiving, we will discuss some common issues caregivers face and strategies for caregivers to empower themselves to improve the outcomes of their loved ones. We will discuss mechanisms for improving caregiver quality of life. Next slide, please. The objectives for this session will include the following. The effects of caregiving are some challenges that our caregivers face. Some noteworthy strategies to help caregivers cope within their new role. Defining and avoiding caregiver burnout. Practical ways to improve quality of life as a caregiver. Lastly, proven and effective caregiver resources. I will now hand it over to Andrea to discuss the effects of caregiving. Next slide. Please. Next slide, please. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in the effects of caregiving, we will discuss what the definition of a caregiver is. As Raylene mentioned, caregivers have a wide variety of motions um, we will discuss in more detail. Also, there are some physical aspects of caregiving, as well as practical issues of caregiving, ranging from financial pressures, role reversals, career sacrifices, and time management. Caregivers of brain tumor patients experience high levels of stress, and some signs of stress are feeling exhausted all the time, getting sick more often than usual, not sleeping enough, feeling impatient, irritable, or even forgetful, not enjoying things you once did, um, and withdrawing from people. Now, several of these signs of stress are also signs of depression, which we will explore a little bit more later. Next slide, please. Thank you, Andrea. A caregiver can be classified in two ways either as formal or informal caregiver. Formal caregiver, those individuals who are compensated through monetary means. These are paid caregivers. These persons typically provide care within the patient's own home or in a more formal setting, such as a daycare, residential facility, a long-term care facility. The other classification is called an informal caregiver. This is an unpaid individual. For example, a spouse, a partner, a family member, friend, or neighbor. Their role involves assisting the patient to carry out what is termed ADLs, or activities of daily living, and in addition to medical tasks. Next slide, please. For the purposes of our presentation, we will focus primarily on the role of the informal caregiver. We will elaborate more on the specific tasks involving this role. These specific tasks include, but are not limited to, carrying out those ADLs, such as grooming, assisting in personal hygiene, feeding. Consequently, there are also IADLs. These are instrumental activities of daily living. They include tasks such as meal prep, shopping, housekeeping, managing finances, 
managing schedules and appointments. In addition to the ADLs and the IADLs, there are specific tasks that are directly related to meeting their healthcare, the patient's healthcare needs, such as medication administration, assisting in symptom management, also serving as liaison with the medical and clinical team. Next slide, please. As previously discussed, there are many tasks incorporated in the role of caregiving. For a patient with a brain tumor, these tasks can be challenging, therefore leading to a variety of emotional experiences. There are some common threads of emotions often demonstrated within the role of caregiving. And then there's a series of mixed emotions that can arise due to the demanding role of caregiving. Next, Andrea will discuss some of these common emotions. Next slide, please. Thank you. There are many emotions that may arise as you care for your loved one with a brain tumor across the care continuum. Here are some examples of feelings that many of our caregivers have experienced, and these are normal emotions. Guilt and anger. You may find um, you may feel angry at the patient for getting ill. Um, or resent the way in which this has turned your life upside down. You may also feel guilty for feeling angry. Your friends and family may also direct anger and resentment towards you, making your guilt and anger intensify more. If you have children at home, their emotions and how they react may also come into play with your anger and guilt. You may experience grief. This grief may be linked to your life you once had with your loved one, the roles you identified with, whether it was your, that person's spouse, friend, lover, mother, sister, brother, which now you have an additional role to undertake. Maybe you are grieving the loss of income, either from your own inability to work, because now you have taken on the caregiving duties, or because the patient is not able to work any longer. Many of you may feel something called anticipatory grief. The definition of anticipatory grief is a feeling of loss of someone or something before they're actually gone. And this is a very common feeling. Now we briefly touched upon earlier about depression. And so depression and anxiety are also common emotions that many of our caregivers experience. And mentioned previously, some of those depression symptoms are also what could be considered signs of stress. So for the most part, a lot of our uh, caregivers will decide to go into individual counseling, which can be very beneficial to them. And also many of our patients go into individual counseling as well. Many choose to go into couples or family therapy. And for some people that say, that's just not really for me, there's other options regarding emotional support, whether it's through a support group or whether it's through a mentorship program. Next slide, please. So continuing on regarding mixed emotions, at times you, the caregiver, may feel some difficulties with coping with the patient's physical and cognitive changes. During these times, you may feel mixed emotions, which mean you can feel more than one emotion at a time. For instance, denial and anger, joy or sadness. You may have confidence in your caregiving, um, and the next day you may have some anxiety about that. But being a caregiver can have rewards too. Knowing that you are doing as much as you can for your loved one with cancer can be very rewarding, as well as helping improving their quality of life and their well being, and having a new, deeper relationship with that person that you care for, and showing others how to give in a positive way. Next slide, please. Thank you, Andrea. In addition to some of the emotional changes within the role of caregiving, one can also expect 
some physical changes to occur. This new role and its demand can lead to physical fatigue due to stress and also increased physical workload, all of which can exacerbate any of the caregiver's pre-existing medical conditions. Through our experience, we have seen caregivers neglect their personal health care or wellness needs, focusing solely on the patient. It is at this point that the physical fatigue will start to manifest. We encourage any caregiver to allocate time for yourself. Think of this in terms of taking a vacation by airplane. Now, most of us will have to go back into our memory stores to our pre-COVID days, but once everyone is boarded the plane, the trip then begins. The flight attendant is now delivering the safety briefing. One of the first instructions that is given regarding the life vest is to secure your own vest first, then assist someone else. This same concept can be applied to caregiving. One is only effective in terms of caregiving if they first attend to their, their personal needs. As a caregiver, this is a delicate balance that we must always work to maintain. Next slide, please. In addition to the physical effects within the role of caregiving, there are also practical changes that can occur. There will be a demand for increased healthcare literacy not just learning more in a general sense, but becoming more familiar and comfortable with medical terminology, medication managing, and also side effects. Caregiving can affect one's ability to work outside of the home, thus affecting the finances within the household. This can change, this change can cause the income to convert from two person to a one person income, or even a one person income to little or no income. It has been my experience that roles can also be reversed depending on previous role assignments. If the patient who now has a brain tumor was the, a household accountant, now because of the brain tumor, this is affecting their mental function. And this role may need to be reassigned to reflect this change. A caregiver's career could also be impacted by the new role, forcing the caregiver to take a leave of absence or change roles at work due to the increased needs within the home. Time management also requires attention. Caregivers serve as personal assistants to the patients in managing the vast number of medical appointments and therapies while also attempting to work and manage the household. So far, we have defined the role of caregiving. We've discussed some of the tasks involved. We've also reviewed some emotional and practical implications. Now, Andrea will discuss caregiver burnout. Next slide, please. Thank you, Raylene. So with everything that we've discussed, as Raylene just summarized for us, um, caregiver burnout may occur and it can occur in various degrees. So what is caregiver burnout? And what can you do to help yourself and your loved one from preventing it or lessening the, uh, the effects? So caregiver burnout happens when caregivers are continuously overwhelmed and don't pay attention to their own needs. I know this is really easier said than done. So what are some warning signs that a caregiver may be experiencing burnout? Your attitude could change, which and you could start experiencing some anger or maybe hostility. You may experience some guilt or shame related to spending time to yourself. Uh, you may withdraw from friends or family. You may have loss of interest you previously enjoyed. You may have feelings of hopelessness and also uh, a lack of ability to control your emotions. You might have like a roller coaster of feelings throughout the day. So what can you do to help yourself? Next slide, please. So let's explore what we know that doesn't work. Trying to do it all 
doesn't work. Uh, you will be overwhelmed. Putting one's head in the sand or pretending everything is a-okay, that nothing has changed. Also, pulling away from your support system, isolating from others, and not acknowledging your feelings and your reactions to the changes in your circumstances. But there are some ways of managing your stress you may want to try. You can choose how you want to spend your time and energy. Select what is really important to you in that moment. You'll want to create um, and build a support network or a support community. This is really vital. Identify who would be in your community. Also, um, ask for help. Decide who you want to ask to do a specific task or assistance. Um, by doing this, you're um, allowing those who love you and your loved one to help, and helping is a very satisfactory experience, and this would be a gift you give and a gift you will receive. Practice saying no. You don't have to do everything. Figure out what you can let go, what you can task out, what you need to do. Manage your self-talk. Um, especially if it's critical, um, it's very important to focus on the positives and celebrate those tiniest accomplishments. You'll have a cumulative effect about that. Learn some or incorporate some relaxation tools such as deep breathing, yoga, meditation, and take a few minutes to yourself every day, several times a day to recharge your batteries. Next slide, please. Thank you, Andrea. This is an opportunity not only to examine your own expectations, but also to ensure the expectations of others um, that they are realistic. As Andrea discussed, asking for help cannot be understated as an effective means to cope. Demonstrating the ability to let go, the need for control, this strategy will serve to alleviate some of the pressures within the role of caregiving. As a caregiver, you will need to set priorities, focusing again on the personal wellness, as we mentioned. Lastly, find meaning in your own caregiving experience. Build deeper connections, lasting commitments. Allow for some self-reflection. Become more aware of your strengths and capabilities as a caregiver. No two individuals are the same, and neither are their journeys. Seize that opportunity to make your journey your own. This can be powerful in terms of coping. Next slide, please. The role of caregiving can be demanding and we briefly discuss, we will now briefly discuss some of the practical strategies for self-care. There are some physical self-care practices and they include prioritizing a regular checkup, specifically identifying this new role of caregiving with your physician. It is always important to maintain healthy eating habits, including nutritious foods, also daily exercise and a healthy sleep hygiene those both are effective means to manage stress and your health. Sometimes a very simple task is taking a walk each day. This can make a big difference in stimulating those positive endorphins and filling those lungs with fresh air. Regarding our mental and emotional practices, we recommend keeping a journal where you log some of the challenges that you're facing as well as what you're grateful for. Keep a written to-do list, continue to reevaluate those priorities and shuffle as needed based on the here and now. Although it can be difficult to balance caregiving with work outside of the home, many caregivers do appreciate work as an opportunity to shift gears and experience a sense of accomplishment. Effective spiritual self-practices include mindfulness, meditation, yoga, leisure activities such as reading a book. Some have found that practicing a religion and being part of a faith-based organization provides a sense of inner peace and contentment. Some places of worship have outreach programs and they can assist families in identifying some of the support. In addition to brain tumor support groups and online forums, 
such as this organized by the ABTA, be sure to enlist the support of your friends and family to share that load. Now, Andrea will discuss caregiver resources. Next slide, please. Thank you, Raylene. You really highlighted some very good um, suggestions, especially the great, uh, the journaling uh, with gratitude. That's a wonderful way to reflect. And if you're having a difficult day, you can go back to the other day's entries and it can be very empowering. So thank you. So I thought I would start off with abta.org caregiver resources um, because I think it's a fantastic organization and I actually refer to them very common uh, to patient and families to go to this website. It has a wide variety of um, high quality information. Uh, so there's the Caregiver Resource Center, the Caregiver Handbook, which we've referenced uh, several times throughout this presentation. There's uh, connections and support groups. And one thing that I didn't put on the slide that I wish I did was the ABT Community U, which is a program that pairs brain tumor patients, survivors, and caregivers with mentors who have been through a similar situation. I've had many patients and families give me such positive feedback about this mentorship program that I highly recommend that you um, look into it. Next slide, please. So for many of our patients and caregivers that are able to supplement caregiving needs with formal caregivers as part of building their support community, as Raylene had discussed previously, a formal caregiver would be a paid caregiver who is able to come into your home. Here we've highlighted a few websites that you may find helpful in that search. Um, we do, I do recommend the Florida Health Finder. You would look under Homemaker and Companion Services. Another resource would be the local Aging and Disability Resource Center. I refer there quite often regarding the state program for long-term care Medicaid. Social Services has Meals on Wheels and Home Services Transportation, just to highlight a few. Next slide, please. And continuing on with some other resources, um, it's quite often that we refer out to the American Cancer Society. They have a few programs that are helpful in that continuum of care, such as the Road to Recovery Program regarding transportation assistance and lodging programs such as Hope Lodge and Hotel Partners. Unfortunately, both are currently on pause due to COVID. They also have information regarding area support groups and education. Cancer Care is another organization. They offer online support groups for brain tumor patients as well as their caregivers. And Triage Cancer uh, provides education on practical and legal issues. So that's another great resource. And to wrap it up, my apologies, um, the final uh, four would be Patient Advocate Foundation. They offer case management services. They have uh, linkage to prescription drug um, programs or copayment assistance, as well as other financial assistance. Lazarus Cancer Foundation are for clinical trial patients, and they provide financial assistance regarding the travel expenses. Family Caregiver Alliance is another great website to check out, as well as the National Institute of Health. Next slide, please. Uh, we can continue to the next oh, slide. Oh, could we go on one more? I'm sorry. You know, that's okay. Thank you so much, Andrea. I often refer to Andrea as our resource queen. Uh, we are definitely lucky to have her expertise available to our patients. There are a number of resources available to assist in regards to patients' ability to carry out their functions um, regarding activities of daily living. These resources are bedded within the community and are typically associated with the larger healthcare organizations. Services such as outpatient rehabilitation, offer physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, all of these are used to utilize and then they strengthen the patient's ability to participate in their own personal care. 
physical, occupational, speech, and uh, those therapies, they receive, they can be received either through an outpatient rehabilitation facility or either as part of treatment modality where those services come into the home. If travel is a barrier to care, those last services are, term, are termed home, care, home health services. In addition to the use of therapy services to improve function, some of these services can also connect patients with devices that can aid to offer the patient as much independence as possible, depending on their functional status. The availability of these devices depends on a variety of variables, such as payer source and need. Some of these devices include walkers, wheelchairs, hospital beds, which are collectively classified as durable medical equipment. Next slide, please. Moffitt Cancer Center offers resources within the organization focused on supporting the caregiver. There's a chemotherapy teaching class directed by either a nurse or a pharmacist. They offer formal education to improve healthcare literacy, educating the caregiver regarding terminology, procedures, host of other important areas of cancer treatment. This is a one hour course offered typically every Monday and Thursday. If those services are does not meet the need of the caregiver, one can have teaching performed as a scheduled outpatient clinic appointment, again, either by a nurse or a pharmacist, where the caregivers can discuss the individualized teaching based on a specific care plan. There are support groups that meet at a regular interval, either over the phone or in person. The goal is to improve opportunities for caregivers, loved ones, to share personal stories, gain practical, advice and receive emotional support from others. Andrea manages one of the support groups for our neurology clinic. Is there any other information you would like to offer regarding this support group, Andrea? Well, thank you. Yes, yeah, so Moffitt has a patient support group as well as a patient family or family caregiver support group that's now gone virtual every Tuesday at one o'clock. And I also have a caregiver support group um, that's gone virtual the first Friday of every month. You can reach out to your social worker or contact the social work office for more information. Thank you, Raylene. Thank you. There is a, also a patient library welcome center on the campus. This department offers informational sessions um, at 30 minute intervals given by a Moffitt team member. They discuss weekly topics or they discuss topics such as health, helpful tips for caregivers, stress management, symptom management, to name a few. There's the AYA, Adolescent Young Adult. This is a special department within the organization designed to address the complex needs of our patient population between 15 and 39 by organizing social events and hosting um, a number of activities. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the needs of the caregiver are factors that must be considered when addressing the needs of our patients. We hope this presentation has been insightful, informative. You've gained knowledge that can empower you as a caregiver and improve the quality of life of your loved one. We thank you for your presence, attention, and digital participation. This concludes our presentation. We will now hand it over to Nicole. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrea and Raylene. That was a really great presentation. Um, now I wanna remind everybody, we have a few minutes uh, for question and answer. So if you really, uh, if you have any questions, you can use the chat box. Uh, you can chat to everyone or send individual questions to me or any of the speakers um, and um, we'll wait a few minutes for if there are any questions but in the meantime I have some questions that were actually submitted in registration that I'd like to share first. Um, as a caregiver how do you walk the line between being supportive and being too intrusive or overbearing? Would you like to take a stab at it, Andrew? That person is absolutely right. It is a fine line. And so knowing that person's personality and knowing what may trigger them or push their buttons um, would be a way to start approaching uh, how to have a conversation. Um, I'm not really too sure what they mean by overbearing. Um, 
So it would have been nice to have a little bit more of a dialogue with that. Raylene, your thoughts? Uh, I'll share some advice that I um, gained from one of the senior nurses prior to her retiring. And um, she often would encourage family members and their loved ones to try to stay neutral um, and present their options. Um, does it require any persuasion or any um, emotional argument, uh, but simply, uh, for example, if they're not drinking enough water, you present the water, you leave it for them to decide, and then you move on. Thank you, I, I like that approach. And along those lines, <laughs> there's another question um, asking, what do you do when you and your loved one who is the patient have differing opinions on their care or treatment? How do you communicate and make decisions? I think that's probably the most difficult thing for caregivers or family members is that if they're not on the same page as their loved one regarding treatment. However, it's really about what that person feels comfortable with. Um, and so it's through trying to get a better understanding of where that loved one's coming from, why they're choosing to um, maybe not continue with treatment, what the reasoning is behind that. Um, through that dialogue, uh, if it's symptom management, that's definitely something you can explore with your medical team. So it would really try to sit down and have an, an open conversation without your own agenda in it, which is really difficult when you're not on the same page. Raylene, um, do you have anything I, to add? I agree. I think the ability to have that open dialogue to um, frame the conversation in terms of safety, identifying what is a nice to have and what is a need to have um, in terms of uh, meeting the needs of the patient. Um, and I think um, just having uh, maybe a family meeting and discussing some of the concerns um, and seeking some um, expertise opinion. Great. Thank you. And one, one final question here is, um, how and what is the best way to take care of the patient to be comfortable and to make them feel confident? Um, I would say that as an informal caregiver, there is such a um, opportunity to individualize that, that care and what you're able to provide for that patient. And so I think um, you can never go wrong with love and just um, supporting them emotionally and um, attending uh, when they're needed and um, being listening to and um, in, in receiving what uh, they're giving in terms of what their needs are. I think Raylene said that really well. I, I echo that. Right. Well, thank you both. Um, it's now 11 o'clock. So thank you, Andrea and Raylene, for that informative session. And for thank those you. of you who asked questions, we now have a short 10-minute break.